Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Bureau County Genealogical Society's second virtual presentation. We're very glad to have you participate and hope you enjoy the presentation. My name is Pamela Howitt, and I'm going to be your presenter this evening. I have one very large favor to ask of all of you, and that is that our time is very limited by Zoom. So please, if you would have questions or comments, we would love to hear them, but please hold them till the end of the presentation so that I have time to finish the presentation. The, to give you a little bit of a background as to who I am, I am not a long-term resident of the Illinois Valley. I moved here just a few years ago to have a more peaceful and quiet retirement. However, I will say that six generations of my family have lived in Bureau County so I'm not exactly unfamiliar with the area. But when I moved here, I was extremely interested in seeing what an amazing historical area this is. We have some really interesting people who have lived in the Illinois Valley. Our important citizens include abolitionist leaders, founders of the Republican Party. Pretty appropriate since the Republicans are holding their convention right now. We've had union leaders. The founder of the United Mine Workers lived in Spring Valley, Illinois. We've had captains of history or of industry, inventors, military leaders. And if you go just a bit outside of the Illinois Valley, We've had three presidents. But what we seldom hear about are the women who made this area great. I was very happy in our January presentation to hear Pamela Lang talk about the women of the Lovejoy family who were also crusaders for abolitionism. But I decided that this was the ideal time to talk about the women leaders of the Illinois Valley because it is the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The 19th Amendment was the amendment who, that granted women the right to vote. Or if I'm being really politically correct, I should say it granted white women the right to vote. Black women had to wait a bit longer, lots longer. But that 19th Amendment was passed by the Congress on June 4th of 1919 and was ratified on August 18th, 1920. So we are right in the scope of the 100th anniversary. What I should say is that Illinois was a leader in its own right. It was the first state east of the Mississippi to give women the right to vote. The women in Illinois could vote for in state and local elections, but not national elections. So Illinois was a leader in women's suffrage. What I decided to do for this presentation is to pick two women leaders from the Illinois Valley that for no other reason that they really impressed me. The first of them is Mary Moreland. And Mary Moreland, you'll hear more about, she was from Wyanette, Illinois. The second one was Mary Hegler-Karras. Mary was a 
from LaSalle, Illinois, and they are very, very different women who just coincidentally both happen to be named Mary. Mary Moreland was born in 1851 in Westfield, Massachusetts. Westfield is in the Berkshires, a little bit west of Boston, about an hour and a half to two hour drive west of Boston. And right before Christmas, her parents were very well educated for their day. Her father was a mechanic and a staunch supporter of the Union during the Civil War. Mary was unusually well educated for a woman of the Civil War era and attended schools in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York, and Chicago. So she traveled around quite a bit. She had a diploma in languages from the University of Chicago and a bachelor's in philosophy and a master of arts from Illinois Wesleyan, which she received shortly before she died. She taught school for a few terms before coming to Illinois and settled in Wyanette. I don't know why, and I couldn't find any reason for why settling in Wyanette. But at the time, Wyanette had 600 to 700 residents. So it was a very small town. In 1886, the Congregational Church in Wyanette had only a very few members and was in very poor financial condition, had no minister, and I'd like to back up a little bit and tell you, it's talk a little bit about the congregational churches in the United States. Congregational churches started in New England and did a lot of other things about uh, the United States, but particularly religious issues started in New, tended to start in New England. And some of its early proponents were Cotton Mather and Jonathan Edwards, who were two of the very earliest American philosophers before American, America was the United States. They, it, the congregational churches had a very strong moral commitment. If you read anything by Cotton Mather or Jonathan Edwards, you'll see that commitment all over their work. And they had no hierarchy. There were no bishops. There were no, there was no pope. There was no central congregational church. Each congregational church reported only to God. And each of them selected their own minister. Unlike religions such as the Catholic and the Lutheran churches where the ministers are appointed by a bishop each church in the congregational churches selected their own minister. So when Mary Moreland arrived in Wyanette, Mary was in, invited to conduct services at the Wyanette Congregational Church in February of 1889. And by July, she had cleaned up the church, added new windows, painted everything, and she was on a roll. By July of 1889, in other words, about five months later, she was examined for her qualifications to be the congregational minister for the church in Wyanette. For the purposes of that meeting, not the meeting not only included the church elders, but also included delegates from six congregational churches in surrounding communities to seek their input into the decision. After examining her qualifications and beliefs, they held a secret meeting, really, come on, a secret meeting, to discuss the issue. And Mary was elected their minister unanimously. However, this seems to have been a foregone conclusion 
because although the uh, men of the Congregational Church held this e extensive examination, the church mothers had already prepared a celebratory feast. They knew she was, the mothers of the church knew she was going to uh, be the minister. Uh, however, Mary had to be persuaded to take the position because this would make her the first female congregational minister in the United States from Wyonette, a town of six or 700 people. However, there is one caveat. There was an earlier female congregational minister by the name of Emma Newman, but she was what was called a supply minister. In other words, she traveled from one church to another and did not have a church of her own. Mary understood the significance of this ordination and in her obituary in the Women's Christian Temperance Union Watchtower, it stated that her ordination was a great innovation for a woman and she needed much persuasion and consulted Francis Willard before accepting. So who's Francis Willard? Well, Francis Willard was a long, long-term friend of Mary Moreland. She was an American educator, temperance reformer, and women's suffrage advocate. Uh, it seemed that Frances Willard did, in fact, influence a lot of Mary Moreland's thought on the issues of education, temperance, and suffrage. She became the president of the National Women's Christian Temperance Union in 1879 and remained president until her death in 1898. And her influence continued even after her death because she staunchly advocated for the 18th Amendment, the Prohibition Amendment, makes sense since she was Women's Christian Temperance Union president, and for the 19th Amendment, women's suffrage, which were adopted after Frances Willard's death. Mary's, Mary Moreland's accomplishments at the Wyanette Congregational Church included the fact that she cleared all of the church debt by 1892. In other words, only three years after she took over. She also increased their membership to 115. In a town of 600 people, that meant that about 20% of the town of Lyonette was a member of the Congregational Church. Pretty hefty membership. And she finally resigned as pastor of the Lyonette Church in 1895 because she wanted to move closer to the Bloomington area, to McLean, she moved to McLean so that her younger sister and a friend could obtain a college education. Mary Moreland was a lifelong advocate of education for women. And she subsequently became the pastor of congregational churches in Normal, Chicago, and Chabance. Hope I'm pronouncing that last one right. The remainder of her life was spent as a traveling temperance speaker and suffrage leader. And she wrote four books during her lifetime. Her books, by the way, are still available on some of the um, antique bookstore websites. And the, finally, one of her major accomplishments not only was in the village of Wyanette, but her ordination led to other women being ordained by congregational churches in New York, Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, South Dakota, and Michigan by 1893. In other words, only four years after she was elected pastor of the congregational church. So let's move on to Mary Hegler Karras. Mary Hegler Karras was born in 1861, so a bit younger than Mary Moreland, 
and Mary was born in LaSalle, Illinois. She was the oldest child of Edward and Camilla Weisbach Hegler. And this family is an incredibly well-educated family. Her maternal grandfather was a professor at Freiburg University, which is where her father studied. And Edward Hegler was one of the founding partners of MNH Sync, along with Friedrich Matheson. Mary was the first female graduate of the University of Michigan in education, or in engineering, excuse me. She then did something incredibly radical for a woman of her age. She announced to her family that she wanted to go to graduate school. And she did so, she attended graduate school at Freiburg University, her father's alma mater, where her grandfather taught. And she completed the coursework for a master's in chemistry, in engineering, and in mining not exactly traditional female disciplines. She worked with her cousin, Clemens Winkler, in his laboratory when he discovered the element germanium. She helped to discover an element. That's pretty cool. And she assumed the management of MNH Zinc when she returned from Freiburg. She was not a particular engineering innovator, although she did have several patents in her own name. But what she was, was an incredibly competent manager of the business. She had a close relationship with her workforce. And when the Wobblies came to MNH Singh to unionize the plant in 1912, the workers linked arms and prevented the Wobblies from coming onto the site. They also linked arms and surrounded the house, the Hegler Karras house, which was next to the factory. She kept M&H operational during the Great Depression and managed four businesses before she could legally vote. <clears throat> By 1920, she was managing M&H zinc smelting operation, which also produced sulfuric acid. She was managing a short line railroad, a coal mine, and open court publishing. Four businesses before she could legally vote. That's pretty interesting. In her personal life, Mary was an extremely quiet, rather shy and retiring person. And the quote is from her eulogy, which was given by Reverend Paul Bronze. Mary was a lifelong Lutheran, as were other members of most of her family. That by the way is Coke, not beer. Um, she was very quiet, not a political radical at all. In 1888, she married Paul Karras, who was a close friend of the family and one of her fa father's protégés. They had six children between 1889 and 1901. She was managing three businesses at the time and had six children. I'm impressed. She also was very ladylike. She did beautiful needlework. She continued her mother's interest in gardening. And during World War I, she made blankets for all of the LaSalle and Peru soldiers who fought in the war. Very civically active but not politically active. Uh, she started the LaSalle Industrial School to teach local girls to sew and therefore give them an opportunity 
to earn money on their own. And this was later expanded to include vocational education for boys. And she started the Paul Karras Lectures after Paul's death in 1919. The Paul Karras Lecture Series is one of the most important prizes for academic philosophers. It still continues to this day. And Mary died in 1936, and her funeral was very typical of the way she lived. She was not at all ostentatious. She was buried in a plain gray zinc casket. Of course it was zinc. It was manufactured at the plant, I believe. And her Paul Barrett's were the key personnel at the businesses. She So, why these two women? Other than the fact that they're both coincidentally named Mary, they were very, very different women. Mary Moreland was very much into literature, languages, and very politically active. Mary Hegler Karras was the consummate engineer. She all of her education was very science-based. She was very civically active, but not politically active. But when I first started reading about Mary Moreland, there was a long article in the Bureau County Republican about Mary Moreland, and one phrase jumped out at me. And the thought occurred to me that they may have met. And you think, oh, yeah, well, why in that LaSalle big deal? It's only 30 miles away. But at the time, without automobiles, it would have taken almost 10 hours to go by horse and wagon between Wyanette and LaSalle. It is, plus the differences in their personality meant that they probably wouldn't have been close personal friends. So how did they meet? They probably met at the World's Congress of Religion. And this was held in 1893 in Chicago along with the Columbian Exposition, the White City, the place where the Ferris wheel first was built. It was a meeting of religious leaders from many faiths. There were, there were Christians, people from Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism. Mm -hmm. The only thing that was probably underrepresented was the of uh, what are called the pagan religions, the religions of the indigenous peoples. And it was an attempt to bring together the world's leaders from a large number of religions to see what they had in common, not what divided them. I'm voting for one this year. I think we need another Congress of Religion right now to bring us all together. It had, it attracted approximately 8,000 attendees. Can you imagine 8,000 people coming together to talk about religion and there not being a fist fight or a squabble of some sort? This is one of the pictures of some of the speakers at the religion at the conference look at the costumes or look at the attire that these people are wearing they are from a large and very diverse cultural backgrounds so what brought together the two possibly brought together the two marys number one is that paul Karras. Mary's husband was one of the major speakers. 
Paul and his father-in-law, Edward Hegler, Mary's father, were two of the organizers of the conference. We don't know for sure that Mary attended the conference. We know she was at the Columbian Exposition, but not that we don't know for sure that she attended the conference. We do know for sure that Mary Moreland did. She was one of the delegates at that conference on behalf of the congregational religion. So, whoops, I'm running into tech problems. One of the things that I think is most interesting about these two women is that they did share one overriding characteristic, their love of education and their commitment to education for women. They did spend a great deal of time advocating for women's education. And as you can see, Mary Moreland gave up her position as a minister to forward the education of her sister and then went back to school herself. Mary Hagler Terrace was incredibly well educated. So they are not the only women from Bureau County or the Illinois Valley that were important. I'm sure each of you in your backgrounds has a number of women that were important, not only in your own family, but in their communities. And we strongly encourage you to research those women. They were very important to the communities they were important to uh, their families. So please come to the Bureau County Genealogical Society to help locate the women in your family who contributed to the history of the Illinois Valley. The Bureau County Genealogical Society has a number of books with very interesting tips for searching for women's history as most of you probably know, it's tougher than researching history for men because oftentimes women change their names. The majority of time women change their names during their lifetime. But please do come to the Bureau County Genealogical Society. We will help you do your research to find women in your family who contributed to the history of the Illinois Valley. Also, you might want to come to the Hagler Harris Mansion. Mary's home, Mary Hagler Harris's home where she lived throughout most of her life is still standing. It is 57 rooms and 16,000 square feet of Victorian splendor. It is a National Historic Landmark. There are tours Wednesday through Sunday, and it is a fascinating place filled with other fascinating women from the Illinois Valley, by the way. One of the things that I had trouble with in preparing for the presentation was that I could not find a book on Mary Moreland. As I said before, on some of the antique uh, book websites, you can find her books but I couldn't find a book specifically written about her. What I did find were a number of articles in the Watchtower written by her. And there is a very interesting article in the Bureau County Republican that was written about her. What I did find was a book written about Mary Hagler Harris. Uh, it is recently published by Southern Illinois University Press and it is available at the Hagler Terrace Mansion in their gift shop, but it is also available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and some of the others, and also through Southern Illinois University's Press. 
So if you're interested in more about these two fascinating women, please feel free to email me at the Bureau County Genealogical Society or please stop into BCGS and let us help you research your own very important women from the Illinois Valley. And with that, um, I will end the formal part of the presentation and open this up for questions and comments. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Nobody has any comments. Well, one thing, one last comment is that we would love to have your suggestions for future presentations. We are always looking for interesting topics or for people who you think might make good speakers for our meetings and presentations. Please do call us, email us, let us know. And if nobody has any further comments or suggestions, then we are at the end of our presentation. And thank you so much for attending this evening. <laughs>